So our, our next speaker is Peter Morton. Peter's the um, strategic strategic policy and planning person at the Powerhouse Museum. Peter's been with the Powerhouse Museum since 2001, and he's a amazing. He has some amazing insights into not only the way that the Powerhouse works, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that, but also about the way the precinct and the stakeholders work. So thanks so much, Peter, and for your support. Peter's been an amazing supporter of the studio. Going. Thanks, Tasha. Um, I wanted to say at the outset how I think valuable this forum is. I think this is a, a real turning point from, from our perspective in that we, we've moved beyond the sort of simple project management approach to thinking about the UPA and the precinct to the next stage of the discussion, which is really about the way in which we activate it and use it. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of those things. I think what we've seen from the presentation this morning from, um, from John and Sasha is that what they've given us is a framework which we collectively can now take and exploit. And that's particularly significant because um, this immediate precinct where we've got um, the Sydney Institute, UTS, the ABC and the Powerhouse together is, I think, <coughs> the most agglomerated learning environment we've got in Sydney. I can't think of another precinct where you've got so many knowledge creators in one precinct. And I think that concept of a knowledge spine, which I think the UPM could be seen as, is a really interesting thing to start to explore and start to collaborate around. That's particularly interesting for us at the museum because a couple of years ago, in rethinking our position, we talking to a lot of stakeholders committed to becoming what we describe now as an open museum. And we mean open in multiple ways. Um, as I'll show you shortly, we, we've done some revitalization work to the building and the brief to the architects that we invited to uh, um, explore that with was how, might we might, how we might open the building to address some of the wayfinding and other issues that I think the powerhouse has had for some time. So we've taken open in terms of the way in which we're rethinking our physical environment. We're taking open in how we might explore and share content so that if you come to the museum these days, there are fewer things behind glass cases. They are much more open in the way in which they're displayed. And importantly, our digital content, of which we now have 80% of the collection online, the extent that we possibly can, we will make open to the public. We'll use Creative Commons licensing to ensure that anything that it doesn't have copyright restraints is freely available for much wider use. And we also want to be open in terms of the kind of creative partnerships we have with artists, with makers, with designers, with, with the industries that we engage with. And I'll show you a partnership that we've had recently with Gerbach. <coughs> in the creation of an exhibition space. And I think what underlines this, and I think what's really interesting to start thinking about in how we might activate the UPN, is notions of co-creation and co-curation of content. And for, mu for museums, that notion of co-creating is a really important concept that, that we're embracing in the way in which we develop public programming and exhibitions and so on. It's what, in the museum language, we call the creation of a participatory culture. And I think you could think about the UPN in particular as, as evolving as a participatory space. I think what, um, particularly the transformer on that space, gives us is a framework for, for different and imaginative kinds of participation. Um, that's the sort of overview. I thought I'd go to some specifics now and give you an example of the way in which we've opened the building and done some other changes that, that reflect this, this approach to, um, to our work. This is the building as it was, um, walled from the street um, and uh, creating a forecourt which was never particularly <coughs> safe, move on, um, to take the wall down and create a very different kind of forecourt. Um, this building here we call the switch house and on that addition to the forecourt will be a cafe and a shop. Um, um, opening up 
the, a new entrance here. Those of you who may remember the site know the site better. It had a kind of a bollard thing um, along here, which was a firmer, a, a, f a further um, inhibitor to it being accessible to Harris Street. Next one. This is the old entrance. Move through. Old entrance. Ah, new entrance. Quite a quite a different entrance experience, but it's actually designed to maximise the sight line. This is called the Galleria, and it's designed to give you a, a long view of the museum as you enter. Gives you a much stronger sense of orientation. Again, it's opening it up in a way that it wasn't previously. One of the big things we did was to take out um, a lift that was the kind of core um, means of, of moving through the levels. This was it here. It was a glass lift, and it ran up that, that cube here. But it was in a very odd space in the building, and it never really um, gave you a, a sense of orientation. So one of the projects was to take that out. Right? And that's where the lift previously ran. So it's opened this whole um, sort of sense of the gallery up by relocating the lift. We also created, as part of this, a new 1,000 square metre exhibition space, temporary exhibition space. This is particularly important for for museums to be competitive now, internationally, you need about a 1,000 square metre exhibition space. We couldn't have done, for instance, something as big as Harry Potter had we not had this space. Next one. This is um, the interior of the cafe and shop, which will open out onto, onto the forecourt and activate it. Um, that's still to be done. And this is the sort of final part of the, part of the um, uh, forecourt activation. This is, uh, these umbrellas are, designed by the Japanese architect Shigeru Ban. They're in cardboard. The cardboard's been tested at the moment by UTS to ensure that it can withstand the elements on, on that forecourt. Um, the white shading on the top will collect water, um, which will be harvested, and um, they'll be lit at night. I'll show you an image of them later. This is the interior of the building um, pre-revitalization. Um, this cube actually had cars and other objects hanging from it when the building was first opened. Um, but um, as you'll see, um, it went. Um, with it went, the alignment of the, of the escalators was changed. Next one. Um, which bring you down into much more open exhibition spaces. We'll talk a little bit about this exhibition as a co-creation co exercise in a minute. And then um, this gives you a sense of, by relocating the lift and putting it in that glass court in the very centre of the museum, the lift becomes the, uh, a point of reference that gives you a sense of your orientation in the building um, uh, uh, from floor to floor. So these have been um, quite significant changes in terms of that, taking that concept of opening the museum and opening the building up. Next one. Oh, out come the escalators. I mean, we'll go to the next one now. Um, I'm just going to show you a few um, images of an exhibition in development. This is the exhibition called Love Lace, the International Lace Award, um, which really fundamentally reinterprets lace. It's not anything that you would traditionally associate with um, traditional craft practice of lace. Um, we invited the architects to that block Jaggers to do the design. They worked with us absolutely collaboratively selecting where each of the objects would go um, and really crafting the spaces to enable that to, uh, to occur very beautifully. Very importantly in this is a is question of the light because light and shadow on lace is a very important element in the way in which it's displayed. Just move through. So it's a series of bays um, that contain, contain large and small objects and here it is dressed as just to give you an example. As you can see there, light's very important. Um, I mentioned a moment ago um, the collaborative programming as well as collaborative exhibition development is a very important element in the way in which we now operate. And the architects that um, have been involved in the revitalization work and working with Chigaru Ban developed in collaboration with us a really fantastic children's activity um, which was called Building Architects. And in fact, quite a few of the, the architecture students from UTS and from Sydney University and UTS University of New South Wales worked on this project which took cardboard um, uh, tubes and enabled them to construct imaginative, imaginative forms. So incredibly successful um, 
public program that we ran last year, it, whilst we're in the middle of that very disruptive revitalization project. <coughs> um, we're also very interested in engaging with the local community, um, and um, we recognize that, and I think this is an important dimension to your own thinking as, as you think through this precinct, not only our thinking as a learning precinct, but it's an important residential precinct, and how we think of the quarter in a way that gives activation and engagement and participation to the local community, I think is a very, very important thing. From the museum's perspective, we want to be seen as a local museum, one that's very much in tune with its community. And this is a project that we have with um, Glebe Public School, um, where once a week the students from Glebe, Pu Glebe Public School come to us for what is an after-school program. It's their after-school care program. And it's, it's designed to um, uh, give them, in a, in a somewhat informal setting, uh, um, an opportunity to um, explore the collection, but also to study maths and science, recognising that maths and science are two of the really challenging areas in, in education right now. Um, um, just, we'll end the images here. That's the museum at night as it was. You can see that intrusion here and the, and the old forecourt. And the last one um, will be um, the museum as it hopefully shortly will be um, um, in the evening. <coughs> so um, I guess to pick those some of those things up, I think um, it, it's interesting to think about how um, the, 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 the UPN itself, but um, I guess this wider precinct, might, uh, might work together to, um, to program in a way that, that is genuinely participatory, that it invites um, audiences and provides audiences with an opportunity to, um, to co-create and, and to, to be active contributors to um, the, uh, the experiences that are available within this precinct. Um, I think um, John referred to a couple of examples in, the, in that earlier presentation. Um, the, the BMW Guggenheim lab that I think um, was in one of the slides and um, uh, uh, is somewhat similar in concept to the transformer is something that I think um, I'd encourage you to have a look at. It's currently in Berlin. Um, it, um, its origins were but it's, it's a very interesting interactive space that the, the design's by the Japanese architect uh, Atelier Baowa, Bao -Wa, and it's, um, it's flexible programming and the opportunity for multiple use, I think is something that would be really interesting for you to have a look at. Mm -hmm. I think a second project that provides um, high levels of public interaction and embraces history and contemporary experience which again I think is something that's important and interesting to do on this side, is a project from the Copenhagen History Museum. It's an interactive video wall, um, and it's, it's called Vegan, V-A-E-G-G-E-N. Uh, it's, an, I think, a very interesting example of um, highly interactive community participation, exploration of a city's history on one hand and contemporary experience on the other. Um, at another level, there's a series of activities that, that we do at the museum at the moment. Um, Craft Punk is a, an example of that, uh, kind of interacting with the maker community. And the sorts of things that I would imagine would be um, would lend themselves very well to kind of coming out of the museum space and onto that UPN space as part of the activation of that space. Um, I, I think. Um, my other message around this is that I think we should start, we shouldn't wait for the UPN to be um, a final, a come, uh, uh, finally designed and, and activated. I think we should start thinking about the way in which we activate the spaces that stand at the moment. Mm -hmm. the, 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 you've got you lap down on, on, on uh, the street level at the moment, but could it spill out or could other activities that, that UPS is currently engaged in 
start spilling out and start activating this space in a less formal and structured way right mm -hmm. now. Um, I, I think that would be a really interesting thing to um, to anticipate and to, and to um, and to and to trial really and to see mm -hmm. what kind of things work and how audiences <coughs> respond to the use, the use of the space. Um, I, I'd really encourage that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we had a kind of interesting <coughs> example of that. Of, um, a week or two ago, I was um, working with New Lab people on, on one of their projects, and we suggested we put those foam blocks that are currently in New Lab out onto the onto the um, EPM itself, and and that <coughs> students put them out, created some quite interesting spaces. Mm -hmm. But sadly, they only lasted 20 minutes because the rangers came down and insisted they be moved. But I think we can break through that and we can... The ra rangers from who? The shipper, shipper rangers came down. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I'm not quite sure what the reason for taking them out was. Yeah, can, and architecture, can you take that as an incitement, yeah. please? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> I think the other interesting tension here, maybe not a tension, but the, the, another interesting thing for you to explore is the way in which... Um, we might provide a framework for genuine community participation and engagement in what we're creating here. I think it's very easy for institutions by nature of their creative force and their institutional weight to um, be the drivers of the activities on a space like this. And it's why we, for instance, have been advocating for um, a museum garden or the participation in the city farm because we saw that as um, a framework around which genuine local community participation um, could take place. We also saw it as a, a learning opportunity for the museum in that um, it is linked with our commitment to sustainable education and sustainable practice. Um, but I think there's an interesting challenge in how we create a new model of place management here, and I know you're going to talk about that this afternoon, but how you think differently about managing space that's got multiple stakeholders, all of whom have keen interest in content and content development and content delivery on the one hand, and then residents on the other who I think shouldn't feel excluded by the kind of um, institutional gravitas that we bring to this, but that who can see this as a very democratic space and a very open space, and one that enables them too to feel that they've got um, the opportunity to create, to participate, to see it as their space as well. Mm. So okay. those are the things that I, I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure everyone's got some questions for Peter. Peter, can I just ask you, I know that in conversations that we've had, we've talked a lot about this incredibly rich archive uh, yes. that the Powerhouse Museum has, and the idea of an open museum, <coughs> the idea of a, perhaps a, a distributed, spatially distributed multiple, you know, at multiple scale kind of institution that, that breaks out of its own physical boundaries at the moment. Can you talk a bit more about what that archive is? Sorry. I'm oh, um, well, there are, <coughs> there are multiple, multiple archives. Um, that, and, and, um, there are photography <coughs> archives. Right. Um, there are archives <coughs> of architecture, that is, architectural drawing. There are individual designer archives, um, there are swatch book collection archives, so that um, Florence Broadhurst collection, a range of others, um, Jenny Key's collection, Lily, you can help me here, Lily, one of my colleagues is here. Um, so, an uh, immense range of collections that, that I guess span a whole range of design practice, industry practice, technology um, that sometimes are driven by an individual, sometimes driven by an institution. Um, uh, so, but very strong in photography. Right. And are they available open to the public? Can uh, these guys find them um, online? Or? Uh, yes, you would find a lot of this online. Okay. Um, if, you go, if you go to the museum's website, you go to search our collections and you enter a word, um, um, it will throw up um, usually photographic or range of photographic records of an object and their significant status. So all the internal documentation that we would have once used internally 
statements of significance and a whole range of other things, they're now generally available on the website. And, and we're a leader in this. I think we've um, internationally just perhaps known um, for really leading um, digital access yeah. online. I was just wondering if you could talk just briefly about the nature of the, the backyard of the townhouse and yeah. how how potentially you're going to create almost a secondary front for the building. Yeah, yeah. Um, in in the early, I haven't got an image of this, but in the earlier images um, from um, Don's back presentation, you saw a building which is called the Harwood Building, um, and the, those of you who know our site will know that it's the sawtoothed building. Um, that you can see from the walkway and you can see from Marianne Street. Um, its origins were, it was a tram shed and um, it's now, it holds the bulk of our staff, it holds a significant part of the collection, small object collection in the basement, and it's a, and, but it also has our workshop, um, our conservation labs, and, and a range of other kind of back of house activities. Um, because the, um, the UPN, will actually um, open up people's potential contact with the Harwood Building, with the side of the Harwood Building, there are, there, are, there are a number of options. If the Harwood Building remains, then one option is to make it much more porous and for people who are passing by to actually see the museum at work. So we could make much more visible the work that was going on in the conservation labs, for instance, or the workshop or other parts of the process of exhibition development. There's the potential also, which is one of the reasons why we've been a bit um, coy with some of the ideas that, um, that Sasha and, and, and John have been exploring, um, which is a more radical proposal, which is to actually redevelop the Harwood building in its entirety. And, and that's why we're, we're holding back a bit on this. <laughs> We'd like that. Um, um, why we're holding back on the southern end where we could create or contribute to a, a public space. But it may well be that if we redevelop the site, um, that that becomes a part of the redevelopment. So we're holding back a bit on on the rethinking of um, of how that um, that's um, that's worked. But there are, there's a set of constraints that um, all of us have been grappling with enable the interaction of a new public space and some of the requirements of the museum to keep you know, object loading and um, exhibition movements and object movements separate from um, the public zone. So there's some quite interesting um, design issues that we've just got to finesse um, uh, around those things at the moment. But a really radical thing and a really interesting thing would be um, a whole new building along Harwood where the Harwood is now that I guess captured something of the design excellence that we're seeing in Gary and hopefully we're going to see in the SciTech project and really helped by the addition of a bold and further addition yeah. to um, really making it nice as an architectural precinct. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to move on. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.